We released our first release in uh, back in February, uh, the Hydrogen release. The releases are named after the periodic table. So the next release will be in uh, uh, September uh, called Helium. Uh, it really, really, truly is a collaborative process in open source by uh, multiple companies. Uh, you've got guys who are Platinum members uh, like IBM, um, Ericsson, Cisco, um, who commit significant um, resources, both monetary and uh, developer, uh, to the project and um, uh, let, let um, uh, move, move, the, move the ball forward. We actually have one uh, representative uh, from the community, Chris Price, uh, here. Uh, Chris is a member of the Technical Steering Committee. He works for an unnamed competitor of ours. Uh, now you truly see this is a collaborative process among multiple companies and multiple vendors and uh, we are all one big happy community, open source community, working towards the common goal. Uh, create the best um, uh, open source SDN controller that there is, that there can be. So, um, I will go a little bit into a background uh, trying to explain why certain things in open daylight are done the way that they are. And the kind of most fundamental question uh, that I would like to start with is actually what is SDN? And um, uh, is it really just control and data plane separation? Uh, is it really just open flow? Uh, does it really have to be a logically centralized control plane? Um, and why label switches. So this definitely is a good and valid SDN use case, but it's not everything. SDN can and should be defined much more broadly. Um, network in itself is a source of a vast amount of useful data, statistics, events, things that are happening in the network that an application um, can utilize or actually a variety of applications can utilize. And uh, the control plane applications that are open flow based or centralized, logical centralized control plane is one type of application that can be written for, uh, for SDN. Uh, it's not everything. So when you look at the SDN as such, it can be defined in a much broader sense where uh, applications harvest network uh, intelligence across all network layers and then uh, use that intelligence to program for optimized experience. So um, it's a broader definition and a wider set of applications than, than just control plane. We can have data analytics applications, applications that uh, take events and react to them and do uh, optimized configuration or optimized programming of the network. Um, we can have things uh, such as network services. Uh, one of the latest examples of that in the open source is the service chaining project that has been uh, uh, accepted as a, as a project into Open Daylight just last week. Uh, another kind of an application is the group-based group policy, which is uh, creating uh, policies similar to what, what you see in APIC, or actually the same policies or same policy definitions that you see in APIC uh, on Open Daylight. So you can take everything from OpenFlow to uh, kind of very value-add applications, policy services uh, that can be put on this platform. Or a platform should be designed to be able to accept uh, applications like this. So it's really about the generic feedback, control, and policy loop between applications and the network. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions, just walk up to the mic here and uh, let's make this as interactive as, as, as possible. So um, in order to design such a controller, it can take a wide, wide variety of applications. What do you need to do? What do you do? Uh, so what should a controller look like? Um, again, in a more generic sense, it is a platform where you can deploy SDN applications, but it should also provide an environment where you can develop these application environments. So when you've seen controllers that have been delivered so far, the Beacon, Floodlight, Onos, 
um, they're kind of more or less vertically oriented systems. They're not platforms for developing applications. They have northbound APIs that applications can use, but the applications that use the REST northbound APIs for controllers uh, are actually developed on different platforms. It's uh, you use your Python or script or JavaScript or have you develop the applications, and you got whatever you got provided through the REST APIs. Open Daylight, in this sense, is much more modular and much more extensible. Um, you can develop your applications in Java, plug them into the controller, and extend the functionality of the controller itself. Um, so, for the platform requirements, uh, the controller should be flexible. It should accommodate a wide variety of applications in order to accommodate the broader definition of SDN. And uh, now, because we've got a wide variety of applications, in order to be able to integrate them in a co coherent and cohesive system, uh, they should, the applications should use a common framework and programming model and provide a consistent APIs to their clients. We need to scale the development process. Open Daylight community is fairly big. There's about 200 active developers working on 20-something projects right now. And um, all these groups are independent. And um, we need to be able to uh, do the development or enable the development of applications in the groups that are independent of each other and allow short integration times uh, because everybody keeps developing up until the last moment and then you know integration comes for a release and within a couple of weeks you've got to put it all together and um, uh, again like the framework for the controller and the application development environment must support something like this we need to support runtime extensibility and modularity so we need to be able to load new, uh, new functionality into the controller at runtime. So the controller has to be able to adapt itself to the changes in the network. Uh, if you install a, new, install a new device in the network, or you need a new application, you need to be able to deploy that uh, onto the controller uh, right then when the new device is plugged into the network or a new, new application is, 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 is loaded. You don't have to, or you shouldn't be going through a lengthy integration cycles that uh, people are used today with uh, NMSs and EMSs. We should also not have to replicate all the features that are in the devices um, in the controller. So the controller should provide a plumbing between applications and the devices without having to um, without developers or the controller writers to do any, 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 any code in there. So, for example, with Nick uh, Convien, there's a possibility for the controller to upload the models from the device right there, and uh, the controller actually generates code on the fly when it finds the models and provides APIs to applications to use those models. Uh, that's the second thing, adapt data schemas and models discovered in the network. And of course, I mean, it needs to be performance and scale, so we need to be able to scale linearly uh, with adding instances of the controller into a controller cluster. So it's definitely a cluster environment for high availability uh, and uh, for linear scaling. So for development requirements, um, SDN has kind of a, one interesting dilemma. Uh, it's at the intersection of two worlds, software and networking. And more often than not, and sometimes quite often actually, um, the developers and the networkers don't find a common language. I mean, the networkers keep networking, developers keep Java, uh, talk, talk Java, and find guys who can do both or who are the intersection of both is, is definitely a problem. So uh, we need a kind of a common language to describe the behavior of the system and the APIs that um, uh, where the net networking guys and the software guys can meet and can argue about functionality. Um, and once we've got that common language, we should be able to generate a lot of boilerplate code and APIs from that, from, from that language so that um, um, a lot of things can be automated. Um, there is a trend uh, in the industry, and it's starting more in the service providers, but going also into enterprises, uh, where uh, devices are being managed 
uh, via NEC called Yang, Yang being the modeling language, and there's a new set of tools uh, being um, made available where um, the Yang, where network device functionality can be described um, with um, the Yang modeling language and um, uh, accessed via the NetConf protocol. So NetConf Yang, and this is the IETF direction, uh, is uh, the kind of the next SNMP MIP direction. And this is, this is where IETF is going, uh, and, and this is where more and more people are going. Um, NetConf Yang is a lot easier to use than um, uh, SNMP and MIPS. And uh, that is kind of the future direction of network management, network programmability uh, for, for devices. So if you design a controller that works with net network devices, we should be using the same modeling tools and the same modeling language as the network devices themselves. Then we can have a common set of um, uh, tooling and we, can, we don't have the impedance mismatch between having to model things on a controller and on a device. And basically in the same work twice. We've seen that over and over in each EMS. Uh, you know, we've got a small army of people who have to re-implement all the features that the device supports uh, up in the uh, EMS uh, in order for the applications that run on top of an EMS can, can take much, uh, advantage of that. So we want to do away with that. Um, so when we look at the uh, controller architecture, um, and you may have seen this picture on the Open Daylight Wiki. Uh, it's kind of a three layers. Uh, at the bottom, it's um, at the bottom, it's um, um, protocol plugins uh, that support different protocols and languages and, and ways how to talk to uh, network devices. Uh, on the top is uh, REST APIs. Uh, which are being accessed by applications. And kind of in the middle there is the controller platform. The controller platform consists of two things. Um, a layer that we call a service adaptation layer that mediates between protocols and functions that the controller itself uh, implements. Uh, we can have a couple of uh, different service uh, function types, like service functions for things like statistics management, uh, open flow forwarding rules management, BSAP, BGPL is what have you, and a couple of foundational network services uh, such as topology and inventory. And topology and inventory is something that everybody needs. I mean, you have to be able to list the nodes that you find in the network. You have to be able to list the topologies at different layers that you that you can find in the network. So uh, kind of a three layers in there, apps on the top, a controller platform with an adaptation and the protocol plugins at the bottom. And I would call this almost like a networking view uh, because there's a network at the bottom and then the controller does the adaptation between the network and the applications. And when you look at it from the software uh, architecture point of view, um, there is actually no difference between protocol plugins and application plugins. They all look the same to the controller infrastructure. So what you've got at the bottom is this kind of a platform with the adaptation layer. Then uh, you've got network devices um, talking, to, uh, protocol plugins talking to network devices, and applications talking to uh, controller services and plugins. Uh, and in the middle, all can be configured uh, by the control and uh, the configuration subsystem based on um, um, NetConf. So uh, the adaptation layer does the uh, adaptation between protocols and, and plugins just like before. But as I said, uh, to the adaptation layer itself and to the control infrastructure, there's no difference. Now, the advantage of doing things this way is that when we go to clustering, we can do the messaging and data store uh, independently and kind of hidden and transparent to the applications and control plugins. So we can do the distribution by using um, some clustering policies and clustering mechanisms behind the scenes and the plugins that uh, people write for the control and run the same in a single instance and in cluster controller uh, um, deployments. Uh, the clustering uh, was not a part of the hydrogen release, but is being implemented now for um, um, uh, helium. 
for those of you who are kind of interested in Java, um, uh, the messaging is going to be, be based on the ACA framework, which uh, originates in uh, telecom in the airline world. The data store uh, is an um, implementation or uh, uh, is going to have a very similar design to the data store uh, distributed sharded data store that, that, is, that is found in the AP controller. So what the controller is actually doing with all the plugins and the applications, it is creating a common network view for applications to use. So you can see all these uh, plugins on the top and basically the controller and the SAL defines an address space or a conceptual data store uh, with uh, operational and configuration substores or subspaces. So, and you have different applications actually creating different branches in a tree. So a BGP, uh, LS topology exporter, uh, creates a subtree that corresponds to uh, layer two, layer three uh, topology that is gleaned from the network uh, via BGPLS. There is an OpenFlow topology exporter which would have a similar subtree for the OpenFlow discovered topology. Uh, so you can actually have multiple topologies at multiple layers uh, being projected to applications to um, by the controller, not, not just the OpenFlow one. I mean, if you need layer three, then there's, there's a possibility to do layer three topology as well. And all these topologies are actually put together um, by different applications. So it's different applications that stitch together this one big data tree that the applications then, uh, then, then use. So uh, again, inventory has a bunch of nodes and we've got flow capable nodes in there. And the flow capable nodes are being added by um, a component called flow capable inventory manager which discovers the open flow nodes and then puts the nodes into the data tree in the cell. Now, the interesting thing is that the statistics for OpenFlow uh, are being collected by a different entity called the Statistics Manager, which uh, again goes once the flow, so the nodes are discovered, it figures out which nodes are in the network, OpenFlow nodes are in the network, and then goes and pulls the statistics from, from those nodes. And then injects those statistics, table, flow, meter, what have you, uh, in the appropriate places in the data tree. Now you can have different types of nodes, like netconf nodes, uh, that are being stitched into the data tree by a different component, in this case netconf. So you can see actually the data tree is, is being put together by different components in the controller, and then it creates an overall uh, uh, view of the network that the applications can use. The view of the network is uh, available to applications either through Java APIs that can go and query the data store, or query the SAL, or through um, a protocol now, REST APIs, and the REST definition of that API is defined in IETF um, uh, REST conf draft for those who are uh, interested or, or familiar with IETF. So when we go into the details of the uh, SAL, it actually kind of consists of two independent paths. One is a binding independent uh, path and one, one is a binding aware path. The binding aware path is for uh, Java applications that are written for the controller and reside inside of the controller. And the binding independent uh, provides a part provides the view for external clients, RESTConf and NetConf. Uh, and uh, uh, also for Java applications that do not want to use generated APIs. Because the APIs for Java, uh, for the binding aware applications, are generated from the Yang models by the tool chain. And there is a connector in between. There is a schema service and a generator for codecs. So when there is a path uh, where a binding aware application needs to read from a data store or needs to write into a data store, um, the translation between the Java and the DOM object model needs to be done and um, that translation code is generated on the fly when the controller finds, uh, finds the models and finds the need uh, that the translation should be done. So let's talk about some applications and use cases. Uh, any questions so far about the architecture? Uh, applications and use cases. Uh, 
the applications that we're talking about here uh, are sh can be shown in the uh, Open Daylight booth here in DevNet, so please go uh, check it out uh, after the presentation or sometime during, during Cisco Live. There's a bunch of knowledgeable people uh, that can uh, show them to you uh, and describe what they're doing. Uh, what I will be do here is kind of go into a little bit more into the guts of the applications, how they're put together inside of the controller. So the first one is the BGPLS topology explorer. And you will kind of see the same design pattern repeating itself for every application. And that is uh, something coming from the network. Uh, in this case, the BGP PDU, uh, they come into the BGPLS plugin. The BGPLS plugin translates this into uh, events where the payload of these events is described in Yang, and uh, uh, this goes then into an operational uh, data store uh, that represents the BGP read. And there can be multiple instances of the BGP read in the MD cell for the multiple BGPLS listeners. So the BGPLS plugin can have multiple BGP listeners, it brings the topology and puts the topology in the MD cell into the operational subspace. The topology is expressed as a tree. Now, when the topology changes, the cell generates a notification to BGPLS topology exporter. What the BGPLS topology exporter does, it reads the BGP read with the BGPLS and LRIs uh, and creates the uh, link state topology that's actually being uh, exported by BGPLS and then injects that back into uh, MD SAL, uh, which has another kind of conceptual operational data store or another part of the data tree which represents the, the link state topology. It can be ISIS topology, OSPF, uh, what have you. Uh, whatever has been learned through BGPIs. And then the application can go and take that via RS cones in JSON or XML format and can go and access that topology and you will see some of those visualizations of how that topology can be visualized by an application in the Open Daylight booth. So uh, this is how it works. You can see kind of a couple of transformations going on and you can actually see the workflow from BGP LSP use to topology being accessed through RS cones being implemented by a series of relatively independent components, uh, um, plugins that have been deployed into the Open Daylight infrastructure. Uh, OpenFlow, we've got another application in there. This is OpenFlow related. Uh, and there is an application that implements the learning switch. And uh, basically, uh, the learning switch reacts to packets coming from the network, so when a packet comes in, uh, the MD cell also acts as a router of, in the OpenFlow plugin, the packet is converted into an event that is injected into the MD cell. The MD cell itself acts as a router of events. And the learning switch application is subscribed to these, these type of events, so the event is delivered to the learning switch application. The learning switch does what it needs to do. Uh, it figures out where the packet is coming from with the source and destination IP address and uh, MAC addresses. Uh, if the MAC address hasn't been learned yet, the flooding is done. And again, this is done as an event injected into the um, uh, MD cell, which routes the event for the flooded packet uh, out to the OpenFlow plugin and to the OpenFlow uh, Java library, where this is translated into packet out. Uh, and what the learning switch also does is uh, it then programs the appropriate flow uh, into uh, the flow tables of that particular switch. And this is done by tickling an API invoked by um, Forwarding Rules Manager. This is the application that manages all flows uh, in, in Open Daylight uh, for all switches. And by that application actually exposing a model uh, in the uh, MD cell, it provides the APIs for other applications such as learning switch to use that API to program flows. And then the FRM itself will use um, another event going into the um, cell to uh, go and program the flow in the appropriate switch uh, in, in, in the hardware. 
And the OpenFlow plugin and library translates the internal open daylight event into um, a flow mode packet or flow mode message going down to the switch. So uh, this is how a learning switch application works. And again, you can see that the FRM uh, is reused either by external applications to directly program flow or to an application that has been deployed into um, uh, open daylight that can provide its APIs to, to applications. So you can actually kind of chain applications or put them in workflows, uh, higher level workflows. Um, uh, in, 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 in open daylight. Again, the OpenFlow plugin can be used by multiple applications, multiple different apps can subscribe to the events that uh, these plugins are uh, generating. Uh, and um, um, it can all be uh, relatively easily integrated with different groups working on all these applications. Uh, and uh, uh, you can actually see that the integration, kind of continuous integration, happens relatively painlessly. Uh, policy group networking is an application that we have developed here in Cisco, and it works with the ICE device. And basically, uh, it programs QoS and uh, access policies uh, into the network when uh, a user is detected. So when a user is detected uh, by ICE, ICE generates an event into Open Daylight. Uh, we have created an ICE adapter, uh, porting BX Grid protocol onto Open Daylight, uh, where it goes into a database, uh, again, an MD style database data store uh, in ICE info. Uh, and uh, from there on, uh, the policy chain is executed. Uh, and eventually, uh, you will see a uh, couple of netconf uh, commands going down to ASR9Ks which program ACLs or ACL entries uh, that represent the policy. So a user defines a policy uh, with a really nice GUI and I would encourage you to go and see that either in the ACI booth or in the Dev Innovate booth. Uh, it's a really cool application with um, fantastic GUI. Uh, eventually this being translated into dynamic configuration uh, of the network uh, via, via uh, netconf. So a user comes in, the policy is applied, you will see the, uh, the ACIs, the ACL entries in the 9 case. user disappears, the ACL entries are automatically flushed. So a very cool application, something that would normally to take weeks to do, uh, you can, it's, it's completely automated. This application took about three developers about three months to develop on Open Daylight. So it's relatively, uh, relatively lightweight, lightweight development process. Uh, another type of application that we've got is uh, what we call I2SS interface for subscriber system. And that is, again, similar, similar approach. When a user connects to the network, uh, an event is generated. And in this case, it's an event going over the NetConf protocol uh, up to uh, uh, Open Daylight, which routes it to an I2SS application. And based on that event, the user showing up, the I2SS application automatically provisions uh, the connectivity and the uh, services for that particular user. So imagine somebody bringing up a branch uh, in a network with um, using a service provider network or a service provider uh, bringing up a new site, uh, this is completely automated. You plug in the CPE, the CPE is detected by the I, uh, I2SS application and all the programming for an e-line uh, connectivity going back to the central office or going, going back to a data center uh, is automatically provisioned through the network. Um, again, like. Uh, please do check it out. It's uh, being run here in the Open Daylight booth uh, and also in um, uh, slash dev slash uh, innovate. Um, so to take that uh, or generalize the previous the applications that we that we that we just talked about, a, a basic uh, kind of a design pattern can be shown for the MD-SAL, which is we can do generic service adaptation 
where, for example, we want to have a generic flow service uh, and uh, have a user not worry whether the flows are programmed via Apple or via OpenFlow. So uh, you can have a couple of adapters, one for um, uh, Apple, one for uh, flows. And those adapters just basically translate the generic flow service data or database uh, into OpenFlow specific or Apple specific things. And it's using functionality provided by other plugins or other uh, applications already developed and present in, uh, uh, in, 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 in the control. It's easily extensible um, and um, uh, it can support kind of generic APIs and generic models. Okay. So, as I was saying a couple times, there is uh, this Debian booth, uh, which has uh, open daylight applications and much more uh, in a uh, quarter rack uh, with all you can uh, need, all you can eat software uh, installed on it, uh, all kinds of really cool applications that we're working on. Uh, so, please go into Debian and check it out. Um, and, um, yeah, you can get the pod, sign up for that, and use it. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, for additional q and I'll be in the DevNet API Expert Zone. Please come over and ask. We can have one-on-one -on -one talks. Any questions so far? Okay. Thank you very much.